wondering, first question we've been asking is, what's the earliest creative piece you remember writing? That's a great question. The earliest creative piece that I remember writing, I would say would probably be in kindergarten. I remember that journaling was a big part of our class. So we would have these big notebooks that would have a big blank spot at the top and then a few lines below. And every morning we would draw and, and write a little bit about our lives or about what was going on in our imaginations. And so I remember writing all kinds of things. My, my creative stories would always have to do with dogs and often <laughs> with princesses and a big house. And I remember I wrote once about um, a house with a hundred rooms and each room had a dog. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, that's not very different from my fantasies now, but, um, but that's an early piece that I remember working on. That is so awesome. That is great. Um, you know, you, you write uh, obviously now, um, but we're curious a little bit too about what you get out of teaching classes and facilitating workshops as a writer. Um, and also like, what do you think is a key element that makes workshops successful? Well, I am somebody who has benefited a lot as an adult from returning to the workshop environment. And so for me, I've learned so much from the teachers that I've had in recent years. I think I started returning to workshop in 2018. And so to be able to have the privilege of paying it forward in some way is really meaningful to me because I feel like anyone can be a writer and anyone can improve their craft. And just having the kind of safe, welcoming environment where people can learn and practice and study and see that um, maybe the, the hard and fast rules that we might've learned as undergraduates or as high school students earlier on in our lives or as MFA students even, you know, um, in earlier times don't have to apply and that we can be more flexible in 2021 and how we approach writing. Um, yeah. so. That's one thing that I really love about teaching. And it's really, and it's really interesting how um, thinking sort of post COVID, we're going to go back to the workshop. And I think that a lot of people will have rethought it over the, you know, over this, over this sort of Zoom break or over the Zoom year. And to come back to it is going to be really, I feel like reinventing, you know, teaching personas, you know, reinventing what, you know, what it is to be in a classroom together again. I think it's all really interesting. Do you, um, do you remember the best advice that you, you ever got from a teacher? Is there something that you, you, th you still think about? Hmm. Well, I had a really amazing creative writing professor in undergrad and um, her name is M. Evelina Galang and she's at the University of Miami and she's, I believe the chair of the MFA program. Mm. And she is such a fantastic writer who worked primarily in fiction, but I recently saw her again for the first time since I was an undergrad when she published her book, Lola's House, which is a nonfiction book where she captured the stories of the Lolas who were um, formerly known as comfort women during the World War II Japanese Imperial period. And these are women from the Philippines who were forcibly taken and, um, and, and made compelled to be uh, sex slaves for the Japanese military. And, you know, she had been working on this even when I was an undergrad and I believe it took her 10 years to, to write this book. And, she went back to the Philippines as a you know Filipina American. Um, her family had immigrated from the Philippines. And I think that she and her journey really inspired me to look at my history. And mm -hmm. when I was a student in her class, I really thought that being literary meant to not talk about my identity, but I have since learned through her 
guidance and teaching that that's a huge part of who I am as a writer. And that's something special that I can offer to a reader. And so I'm so glad that she encouraged my curiosity and my roots. And certainly her example led me to move to Korea as um, a journalist soon after college. And that's a central part of my work now. And it took me a long time to be able to fully understand how my roots and how my history and how looking at um, the past can really inform my present and my future. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's tremendous. I mean, you mentioned Lola's house as a you know transformative book for you. I wonder if you might be able to talk a little bit about also um, any other books that you might be reading right now, um, uh, who your favorite kind of writers are, what you keep on your bedside table that you return to? Sure. Um, a recent book that I found uh, is Matthew Salis's Craft mm -hmm. in the Real World. And I highly, highly recommend it for anyone who's teaching creative writing or learning in creative writing. Because it has blown my mind in terms of Matthew's ability to uh, talk about you know, the definition of the word craft, how it has been so limited in the past and how now is a time where we can be really expansive and thinking about structure and thinking about character and narrative histories and seeing these, seeing his respect for different traditions in writing has been really empowering for me. And it certainly informs what I want to do as a teacher. Yeah, that's... And then in terms of other books, um, I mean, I have a couple here <laughs> just by chance. Um, I recently bought another copy of Dicte uh, by Teresa Hak Kyung Cha. And I read this, this edition as an undergrad. It was, this was the first Korean American work of literature that I ever encountered. And it is very experimental. And I feel like right now it's sort of having its mm -hmm. heyday again after um, Kathy Park Hong wrote about Teresa Hak Kyung Cha and Minor Feelings. Um, and another book that I think is almost like a literary descendant of Dicte is um, Don Mi Che's DMZ Colony, which is a poetry collection. I believe it won the National Book Award recently. And I read it a couple months, a couple weeks ago um, when I was having a nice little writer's retreat at the Highlights Foundation. And I felt like having that time and that quiet to really sit with this book that also plays with image and text and poetry and prose, um, drawings and photographs is really important and um, very instructive for me as a writer. Mm. Now, uh, now here's a, we, we meant this is kind of a fun fun question, but who is a character, you know, a literary character, a film character that you wish, you know, was a real life person, you know, that was like your bestie that you had <laughs> on speed dial? Oh my God, without a doubt, Ramona Quimby. <laughs> <laughs> and Beverly Cleary passed away last month. We're talking in late April of 2021. And Ramona has been such an important part of my life. Aww. My dog is named Ramona. <laughs> um, I wrote about Ramona in my seventh grade autobiography and talked about how she was so important to me in understanding the complex ways of being a girl mm. that you didn't have to just be this perfect, pretty, rich, character that you could have flaws and learn from those flaws and that you your family could suffer real life misfortunes not not fairy tale catastrophes but things like helping your father to quit smoking yeah. things like um you know not having enough money to make ends meet and I mean I think Ramona books are where I learned the terms scrimping and pinching um <laughs> And so her, her wildness as a girl and her um, very real life seeming self has, has been a huge part of 
me learning to be a reader and a writer and um, Beverly Cleary's books bring me so much joy and I feel like still spark a lot of life um, and, and happiness for me. Oh, that's so great. That makes me want to return to <laughs> those books. Wow, that's really lovely. Um, just how books can make an imprint on us, you know, as young people um, trying to figure out the world around us. So, wow, that's so lovely. Um, and you mentioned highlights uh, as well. So I was just like, man, I still have my highlights for children magazine tucked away in boxes. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm so jealous. <laughs> I couldn't let them go. So um, yeah, that's really, really beautiful. Um, I wonder, you know, with you, we talked a little bit about reading and writing and things that inspired uh, your, you. I wondered if you, talk, if you would talk a little bit about the act of writing itself. Do you have any writing rituals when you kind of go to, to your writer's desk or chair or table? You know, do you um, write long form? Do you keep particular pens or pencils around? Do you have to have a certain drink? Do you have to write in the morning or the night? Like, talk to us a little bit about maybe any rituals you have when you, when you actually um, go into the, the imagination world that you have set up. Definitely. One thing that I'm so grateful for is in this time where we're still staying at home, um, still trying to fight this pandemic, my husband got me a door hanger for my office doorknob and it says I'm writing. It's like a, <laughs> a carved piece of wood that I can just hang on the doorknob. And I think just having that mm. little bit of um, a sign, you know, some sort of um, intention that I can literally hang on the door really helps. Mm. Um, I also have been getting together with a group of fellow writers over Zoom. Uh, we meet every Tuesday night. And one of the writers is my good friend, Chris Lee. And she is, I think, the first like literary writer that I got to know as an, an adult in Korea. And she has been really like a big sister to me. Um, somebody who has encouraged me and made me feel like writing was something that I could do and not just in a journalistic context that that literature could be a part of my life as an adult where I think as a journalist I sort of felt that I had chosen this one path and this was the only path and um and knowing Chris and having her encouragement and friendship has really helped me mm -hmm. um I, I write in many different formats. I write by hand in a journal, which I have right here. I, I think I've cranked through at least two. Um, I, I use my journals as sort of a catch-all, uh, mm -hmm. both for my free writing and then also for keeping track of my different projects, because in addition to writing nonfiction, I also am still a journalist. And then I also have client work that I do. So I just try to keep track of all my deadlines and make to-do lists. Um, in addition to just writing what comes to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I also, my husband got me a, a manual typewriter <laughs> earlier in the pandemic, and that has been really fun to practice on. And for me, using a typewriter where there's really um, no easy way to go back and correct. So I just kind of try to keep going, like keep that forward momentum going while I'm writing and um, being able to just shrug off or even laugh off my mistakes has been really fun. Um, and so that's a really fun tool that I've been getting used to recently. Oh my God, the typewriters give me PTSD from <laughs> like my very first big, you know, papers um, as an undergrad, you know, I had to type. And right. imagine having OCD and typing a full page and then making a mistake in the last sentence. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, oh, so I would painful. like that time back in my <laughs> life. Like all those times I retyped whole pages because I was too proud to use whiteout in that last, in that last sentence. Um, I wonder <laughs> if you would, could you, you um, could talk about your editing process, you know, um, and how you might approach it. You know, do you let do you let things sit for a while before you're going back to it? Do you 
you talk about a writer's group. Do you, do you share it with people? What's your, what's your editing process? I think that I would describe my editing process as very multifaceted. I am really lucky to have a writer's group. Um, aside from the one that's been meeting on Zoom, um, I have another writer's group that I've been a part of for several years now. Um, we're all emerging writers and none of us have published a book yet. Um, some of us are, are getting close. Um, and we used to meet in person um, in New York City and have been meeting online. And it really helps to get feedback from people that I really trust. Um, we're mostly women of color in this group. And uh, I think three out of six of us are Korean American women. So it helps to have an audience that really knows me and where I'm coming from. So that has been a huge help. Um, I also, as I mentioned earlier, have taken a lot of classes. Um, and in those sorts of settings, it's great to have fresh eyes and to be able to hear what a reader is not able to understand easily because I want to meet people where they are. I don't want to be purposefully obtuse in any way, especially coming from my background in journalism where clarity is so important. Um, and, you know, I've been lucky to work with professional editors on essays that I've been able to publish um, in literary magazines. And I think having that set of eyes of having one person who I really trust and admire helping me to shape a piece has been really helpful. And it helps me to push too. And um, one of my um, former teachers, Michelle Philgate has mentioned um, how editors can, can really save you too. Um, uh, I heard Michelle and another writer, Allison Kinney speaking at a conference where they talked about Sari Botton, um, who was formerly at Longreads now um, also with also editing with The Guardian and other um, other projects. Um, she's working on a, her own memoir right now. Um, and, and they, you know, sang Sari's praises and said how much they can trust her. And um, I really have learned from, from their example. And, um, you know, I work with Allison Lichtenstein at Catapult on a column that I'm writing. And she is so bright and has such a keen eye and I really feel like I can trust her. And again, it's such a privilege because she's also Korean American to be able to have that shared history with her. Um, so it is, it is a process that I feel like has been very collaborative and exciting for me. It is shocking, isn't it? That like, what a good editor, how exciting it is. Mm -hmm. I feel like the one, the, the couple of times that I was, um, I, I worked with a professional editor and saw their work, I, it was it was astounding, you know. Yeah, it that's makes such a difference. Amazing. That's amazing. You're you're doing so many different types of writing. I'm wondering, and you talked about this uh, journal that was kind of a catch-all for all your projects. How do you manage everything? How do you manage all the deadlines? How do you kind of go about? Uh, what feels like it's feeding you in the moment, what you have to maybe put away and come back to. How do you juggle as a professional writer? Well, it's it's been very hard in the last year. I was just reading an interview um, with four artists, Asian American artists that was published by NIFA, the New York Foundation for the Arts mm -hmm. uh, this morning. And um, one person who was interviewed is the poet Janelle Tan, who I've gotten to know online over the pandemic. And she said that early on, she felt this, this real pressure to make the most of this time and to be really productive. And I felt that too. And I really felt like I could not rise to the occasion. And I think I spent most of 2020 feeling really bad about myself. Um, I mentioned this column that I've been working on with Catapult and it's taken me a full year to, to finish uh, one essay um, where earlier, you know, when I pitched in 2019, this idea, I thought that I could work on a monthly cadence and maybe I could have if life had continued at, as it was in 2019. But I think that adjusting to the realities of the present has made me, has really forced me to 
to take care of myself, my mind and my body, and realize that that is also in service to my writing. And I, I've been thinking about how, oh, I'm sorry. I've been thinking about how, um, how the past year is going to be instructive for me going forward. And I think it, it, I'm not really sure yet, but I think it has something to do with understanding depression and understanding mental health challenges in a way that I never had before. Uh, I mean, mental health has been a big part of my writing. Um, I contributed to an anthology that was all about mental health and illness um, that was targeted toward young adults, edited by Kelly Jensen. But um, even then, when I was writing from a place of my own experience, so much has changed in the, in, in the intervening years that I feel like I have an even deeper understanding now of what it means to struggle, especially in a time when so many other people are struggling. So um, I think that has been a real adjustment to me. And then uh, I, I feel like I'm still a work in progress in terms of keeping everything organized. I have spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> where I keep track of, you know, what have I invoiced? What have I not invoiced? Have I been paid yet? Um, in my journal, I keep my to-do lists and cross things off and um, try to be, it, it feels really good to be able to, to physically cross things off too. And so um, I think having a mix of different systems to stay organized helps, um, but I, I don't think I have all the answers in any way, but I try to just be open to what other freelancers say and um, I try to be generous with any tips that I have and um, so I think you know it's all it's all a collaborative process totally now do you do you have any um, post-covid dream travel <laughs> fantasies yes <laughs> I wanted to go to South Korea very very badly in 2020 I actually had a work opportunity that might have allowed me to travel to South Korea in uh, December of this year, or uh, no, in uh, February of this year, um, or that which would have happened by now. But I had I had to decline um, because it just didn't feel like the timing was right. This is before I even knew when I would get a vaccine, and it just didn't feel like the right decision for me and my family. Um, but I am dreaming of going to South Korea at some point. I don't know if it'll happen in 2021, but I hope 2022. I lived in South Korea from 2007 to 2013, and it is a place that is vitally important to me and my writing. And so I'm really hoping to get back to Seoul and um, also my father's hometown of Gwangju. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the nearer future, I'm really looking forward to doing my first writer's residency in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Um, it's my husband's home region, Northwest Arkansas. And so I'll be at the Writer's Colony at Dairy Hollow, which um, was a residency that I had um, found out about and won a fellowship to in 2019 and then had planned to go in May of 2020 but now I'll be going in July of 2021 and I can't wait to have the time because I think it'll be really sustaining um, to have that uninterrupted time and space to work on my writing in a beautiful environment. Yeah that is so great. Um, I have one last question for you. But since you mentioned residencies, while it is fresh on my mind, I just want to um, give you a kind of shout for maybe another one if you're interested. Um, yes. Uh, the residency foundation, it's called the Oak Spring Garden Foundation. Um, and they are based in Virginia. And it's a residency program um, where the cohort is a mixture of writers, uh, musicians, dancers, uh, visual artists, botanists, and plant scientists. And it's on this beautiful farm. Um, they put you up in housing, you get a paid stipend. Um, they cook all of the meals um, from the fresh farm food there. Um, and it might be something you're interested in. The deadline's in July. So I'm just gonna throw that out at you, but the I'll be going this July and the direct 
to let people know about it that I thought would be maybe a really great fit. And it seems like it will be a really beautiful opportunity. So I'm just throwing that to you. Keep, keep, keep them in mind. It's five weeks or two weeks, depending on which program you apply for. Thanks, so. Lauren. Oh, they're, they are on my radar. Um, Cause okay. I'm, I'm from Virginia and. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And I had heard about um, Oak Spring and I saw that you were going and I was so excited to see that. And um, oh, yeah, I, I will, I will definitely <laughs> apply. Oh, that's, that's great. Um, I, yeah. I, I really hope you do. I forgot you were from Virginia. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. I'm so glad. Um, okay, the I guess the last question, the kind of outro question, um, is you know you've you've been working as a writer, been working out a as a journalist, writing in all of these different mediums. You've taken craft classes. Um, you've talked about you know some significant mentors and teachers that you've had in your life. Um, what would you offer to an emerging writer who's coming to this conference trying to figure out how do I do this? What would be the thing that you would pass on to them? That is a great question. I think that I want to be as open and as encouraging to a writer at any stage in their career it's, but especially for folks who are toward the beginning of their journey as writers, I, I feel like truly anyone can do this. Um, I think I read this in Alexander Chi's essay collection, How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, that writing is something that anyone can improve at as long as you stick to it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I really want to share the message that there's no right or wrong way, um, that you don't have to call yourself, you don't have to say that you're not a writer if you don't do it full time. I, I think every artist that I know actually um, does something else, you know, and to, to bring in income. Um, and, you know, there's even a book by Sarah Benincasa that real artists have day jobs that, that I really, it's an essay collection that I really loved. And so, um, you know, there is no shame in having a day job. A amazing people, greats like Toni Morrison had their, had day jobs and, and wrote in the early morning hours. And so squeeze in the time that you can, it's okay to take a break from it. It's okay to take a full year and multiple years um, you can always return to writing. And I would just say to read widely, read diversely. Um, I try to read from the past and the present. Uh, I try to read writers in translation, writers from outside the U.S., from inside the U.S., from all different walks of life, um, ages. Um, and yeah, just, just try to read voraciously and, and, and write in any way that you can and to, um, to find your people too. And I think conferences like the IU WriteCon are amazing places to find folks who share your passion and who can encourage you and um, hopefully folks you can stay in touch with and make part of your journey. Oh, thank, thank you. you. That's so great. That is so thank great. you so much, Lauren and Bob. Yeah, no, thank you. It's so exciting. It's great to meet you.